Matt Cook, Artistic and Executive Director of the Sierra Madre Playhouse. Welcome to Cultural Attaché and happy 100th anniversary. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me today. And that 100th anniversary is the reason that we're speaking. And I have a horrible thing to admit to you at the stop of our start of our interview. I have lived in Southern California my entire life. I have never lived anywhere else. I have never been to the Sierra Madre Playhouse. What am I missing out on? Oh, it's time for you to come out. I mean, it's it's a wonderful community. I mean, have you been to the city? Of yes, of course. Okay. Okay, cool. Because a lot of people haven't. It's, you know, off the beaten path if you don't have a reason to be there. Um, but it's a great institution. It's one of the landmarks of the city. It's like we're known for bears that get into hot tubs, the Wisteria Festival, and the Playhouse. Um, so it's a really uh, charming space. It's been many things over the last hundred years, from a theater, a movie theater, um, to now a performing arts center. So there's wonderful stuff going on. Right. And I believe that when it opened as a movie theater, you just mentioned the name because it was named the Wisteria Theater, was it not? That's right. It went from a furniture store to the Wisteria Theater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, been, it's, it's been through a lot of things. Now, the... The theater, the building that we know as now as this as the Sierra Madre Playhouse did actually open on February 2nd, 1924. I know you came, you know, to Sierra Madre Playhouse beginning with uh, September 1st of mm -hmm. last year. Had a hundredth celebration already been in the works or is this something that you came up with a, as a way of sort of reintroducing the Sierra Madre Playhouse to people maybe like me who had never been? So, you know, the board is full of stakeholders that have been in the community for a very long time, some of them 30 years. So they had it on the radar to celebrate it in some way, but it hadn't been formalized. Um, so this is step one, you know, this weekend, but then we'll hope to have a big birthday party in the summer, um, you know, try to celebrate all year. So I'm just a piece of the puzzle. <laughs> right. So this weekend is centered primarily on Harold Lloyd's films. That's right. um, you know, what made Harold Lloyd the right person to sort of anchor this first leg of this centennial celebration? Well, he was one of the biggest stars in 1924. And so this whole weekend are comedies from 1924 that were either made then or released then. Um, so he was an easy choice. Um, and our curator of the weekend is Laura Gabriel, who is a film historian. Um, so she actually got in touch with Harold Lloyd's granddaughter, Sus uh, Suzanne Lloyd. Um, so she's going to be a big part of it as well. So we're just kind of honoring that era. And he was, you know, one of the biggest stars. Now, I read an interview that Suzanne Lloyd gave to Variety last year. Um, and she said, and this is a fairly lengthy quote, so bear with me here. He, in a lot of ways, was very much like the character he portrayed on screen. He had a lot of interest in life and people and what made them tick and what he could do to make things better. He liked to promote people from writers to directors saying, go out and do your own thing. Go and do your own movie. It sounds like she's discussing the job of an, of an artistic director at a performing <laughs> arts venue. Yeah. I mean, does that does that sound a little bit like your job as as well as his perspective of what he did with his career? Yeah, in ways it does. You know, with the exception that I'm also trying to look outward to the community and not just have it be what I want to do, but it's like, what do we want to do? What do what can I be the bridge to the community and the arts, you know? So it's a little bit of both, you know? Well, so is when you're, when you're in a big metropolis or surround part of a metropolis that includes Los Angeles, which is a cultural center in this country, how do you balance out what is the best thing to service the immediate community around you versus what is the thing that maybe will get more people to pay attention? Yeah, it you know, that that is a balancing act. You know, we're in a unique position that we've been an institution for 100 years, but this year we're trying something brand new. And that idea, you know, came up before I got here, which is why they hired me to transition into a performing arts model. Um, so what I'm trying to do is provide world class artists at a very accessible price point. They've never had $12 tickets there and $10 tickets there. Um, so, you know, just trying this whole year is a proof of concept and they're like what does the community want what do they need um so we're listening we're asking a lot of artists asking a lot of community members and we're trying to represent not just sierra madre but now los angeles county like we're really trying to be the regional performing arts center in east la there are venues like us you know in downtown the music center or the broad and uh you know the west side and the sarai and northridge but there's no true performing arts space in east la 
And so even though we're intimate, I just hope that we'll become the satellite version of one of those, you know. What, satellite version meaning what specifically? So more intimate. So those venues have 500 seats or more. Um, they can, you know, pay an artist if they wanted to $75,000 for the evening. That's not going to be us, but we can still have world-class version. We could even have the same artist, but instead of their opera, we can produce their string quartet or something. You know, it's like we want to have the same quality, but in an intimate setting. Right. Now, you you alluded to the fact that the building that the Sierra Madre Playhouse occupies was originally a furniture store. And it had been a furniture store for 16 years before it became a theater, mm -hmm. which to me sounds like people, you know, the people who held who owned that property were seeing the writing on the wall, that there were changes happening and that they wanted to take advantage of that. It doesn't seem like that's totally apart and separate from what we're facing now. I mean, what are the what do you what are the challenges for you in competing, you know, not just with some of the arts institutions that you've you've mentioned, but for things like this, which seems to be the way a lot of people choose to, you know, indulge in whatever their particular passions are. How how do you how do you face that moving forward into the next hundred years? Yeah, well, I think places for people gathering will always be needed. And I think the human experience will always be needed. Um, there is a vulnerability, I think, of live theater or live singing, or live music that is it you can't replicate on a device so i think creating an experience is the next step so it's like having that as a baseline within an experience so maybe not just a recital but some something that the artists talk to the audience they include them in the process something they can't get on youtube um that's the next step and then making it accessible and that's not just price point that's genre that's also day of the week time of day um, also price point, also marketing efforts to make sure that anyone that wants to be a part of it can be. Um, so there are many factors, but I, I'm i not so worried about that. I don't think theater will die. I think that we just have to be reasonable, like every theater is keeping the costs in check and not, you know, planning for something that isn't possible. You know, but you're, we're, we're in an environment where Center Theater Group has all but abandoned any sense of a season at the Mark Taper Forum. They've got occasional events in there but nothing formalized like we have all become accustomed to them having that doesn't bode well for for you know that's the smallest space at the music center yeah that's true and it's a, you know, one of the best theaters in the world um but we're unique in that our overhead is much lower it costs them so much money to open um that i'm not sure of their you, you know their exact business model and how they you know filter the revenue and philanthropy but I would imagine that they need to reduce the amount of uh, work that they put forward. Perhaps they're too busy or too too much overhead. I'm not sure. But I feel like we're actually in a really good spot and that over the next five years, we'll grow a lot and then probably plateau in like a really comfortable, you know, mid-size range. Well, you know, I was I was talking to Thor Steingraber at the Soraya a couple of weeks ago because they just had an, an acknowledgement of the 30th anniversary of the Northridge earthquake. And he was talking, frankly, about seismic shifts that are going on in the performing arts organizations. For instance, there's very little, if any, culture covered in the LA Times. There used to be regular sections for that. Um, and that an institution like the Soraya is competing for advertising dollars, not in print, but online, but they're competing not with other you know, performing arts organizations. They're competing with Nike. They're yeah. competing with these big monolithic corporations that individual performing arts venues just don't have the budget, you know, to handle. Yeah, so, right. you know, what do you see as, as the main task ahead of you in finding a way of carving out that space so that people know about the Sierra Madre Playhouse? Yeah, I think finding something that is so special that relates to them being the individual patron for that genre, that that it will cut through the noise for them. And I think part of the fun for me, similar to Thor, is that it's not just an opera company, it's a performing arts center. So we have many tools to reach the communities. Um, and there's not just one audience that we're marketing to, and I'm pretty sure Thor would feel the same. Um, that, you know, I think finding something that resonates on a human level and then trying our best to find out what marketing strategies connect with them. Um, you know, this is brand new for me, getting to, you know, 
present and market 60 shows at one time. And just think about the communication channels involved in that. Like how many times can you mention them on social media? How many Google ads can you buy? You know, it's it's intense, but so far it's actually going very well. Uh, but we'll see with time, you know, how to tweak it. When you came in, in in September, how much of what is currently on your calendar, you know, were events that you put into place versus what were already in place when you accepted the job? So nothing was in place already. Um, the one contract that had been signed was the show that just wrapped, which was Confessions of a Prairie Bitch, which I came on right before that was signed, but it was so far down the road. I'm like, absolutely. And she was amazing, um, Allison Arngram. Um, but so that was it. Um, so the rest is me. And so we announced the first half of the season. And in March, we're going to announce the second half. Um, it's been fun. <laughs> Has it? Yeah, it's been great. It's been a ton of work. Because when you hire someone in September, you know, which is just how long it takes, um, we had to announce the season, I think, in mid-October or early November, and then put tickets on sale by December. So that's so much just on the artistic side, yet alone all the other parts of my job that are not booking, you know, so it's also artist availability, like there's so many variables. So yeah, it's been a lot, but it's been a lot of fun. Is there, I, and maybe this is an altruistic fantasy that I might have, but is there sort of like you know, an, an artistic director's self-help group where you guys, you know, the men and women who are dealing with these challenges can all get together occasionally and sort of talk about the best way to make Los Angeles better for the performing arts? Absolutely. I don't know yet of a Los Angeles specific performing arts one. The nonprofit partnership in Long Beach has an arts director's affinity group, I guess. So maybe that's kind of it. But APAP, which is Association of Performing Arts Professionals, that's a national organization and they have lots of groups, um, you know, they're like support groups to talk about this kind of thing and various fundraising issues and all that. But I would love to get more involved locally and see, you know, I, I don't know, I should ask Thor, you know, what is he a part of? Um, but there aren't that many, like for how huge the city is, there aren't that many organizations that do what we do. And it would be nice to share resources and learn from each other for sure. Right. Now, you've been involved with other performing arts organizations throughout your career, so you've experienced the highs and the lows that come come with, with this line of work. Yeah. What inspires you most at this point today about the best events to produce and the best way to present them? Well, you know, I think be flexible, and that's fun. Like, problem solving in general is fun for me. You know, I'm a performer, and so my whole life spent practicing was all problem solving every day. You go and you try to get better. So um, I think being flexible and remembering that the audience taste does come first. And that's not at the sacrifice for what I think is good. I would never present something that I don't like, but I think really listening and thinking about audience impact is important. You know, throughout my career, I've been in many different projects, all of which I've loved. And early in my career, some of them were very critically successful, got awards and things like that, but they had a hard time pulling an audience in our own city. So I had to reflect on that. It's like, oh, like, you know, why isn't this resonating? I'm not finding the community that I wanted. So, you know, trial and error. And even with the opera company that I led, Pacific Opera Project, they were great at, you know, not taking themselves too seriously, but keeping the art at an extremely high level. Um, so I think learning from experience, learning from my peers, you know, I think, you know, there will always be a place for what we do. If we keep the intentions in the right place, we're not a bank. The goal is not to make money. If we just wanted to make money, you know, we could do Chicago uh, 12 months a year and do a really high, you know, quality Broadway style thing. But I'm not even sure that that would sell for that long. You know, I think just being flexible. Well, you have to be Barry and Fran Weisler to get it to sell that as long <laughs> as, as Chicago has sold. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, it's a lot to that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Good or bad, there's a lot to that. Exactly. <laughs> well, you brought up Pacific Opera Project. I mean, I happen, I find them very fascinating. And I think one of the reasons they are thriving is because they are not doing things the way you're supposedly supposed to do them. You know, Madam Butterfly, seeing that in Japanese and English, mm -hmm. to me made, made me realize that I now want to hear Carmen in Spanish instead of French, for instance. I'm sure it's on the table. <laughs> it probably is. It probably yeah. is. But how much, how much do you think that kind of thinking is what's necessary today? I think it's essential, uh, you know, and that's not to say that there's not a place for doing things how they've always done, but it should be a piece of a much larger puzzle. You know, 
I think organizations like Pacific Opera Project are really creating the path for the future. You know, it's like they care about the audience and the art form. And there are a lot of problems with the art form. And at a certain point, you say, how do I fix them? You know, they don't, it, they don't have to be a library. All these performing arts organizations don't have to just be a library. And you don't have to be Broadway. There's space in the middle. Um, so I think a lot of organizations are finding it. And I think that's what I want to do at the Playhouse, too. It's like, you know, create a little bit of everything, but make sure that it is with the intention to resonate with someone, not just to be art for art's sake, you know. And hopefully an, a way of establishing, you know, a new identity for, for the Sierra Madre Playhouse. Exactly. It's a fun challenge. You know, it's a blank slate with a hundred year history. You know? <laughs> right. Well, you did say, in, at least you're quoted in the press release. Let me get it up here. As, as that you, you, saying your goal was to, quote, expand the Playhouse into a full performing arts center as it heads into the hundredth year anniversary. Now, you assume the role on September 1st. That release came out on October 25th. What's been the most rewarding aspect of moving towards that goal? And simultaneously, what have been the biggest hurdles in moving towards that goal? So the first part was, what are the most fun? What's been what's been the most rewarding aspect of working towards that goal? The, the most rewarding, I think, are connecting with a lot of artists. Um, you know, to build 60 performances in just a couple of weeks means that I got to call a lot of my friends, a lot of my peers, a lot of people that I look up to. I think giving world-class artists in Los Angeles a platform for their work has been really exciting, especially things like the jazz series. My friend Greg Poré is helping me curate it, and we're finding that there aren't a lot of listening rooms for jazz in Los Angeles. There are jazz clubs, but that has dinner, that has wine. That's like a different vibe. This is like a resonant space. It's just there for listening. So I think it's been cool getting artist feedback like that. And in terms of the challenging part, I think the challenging part is not having any time to kind of ease into it. You know, I think like the LA Phil is going through a CEO transition and right now they have an interim CEO that is very seasoned as, uh, you know, our guy goes to Boston, I think. Um, so he's going to New York. He's going to New York. Well, New York? The, yes. Well, the Gustavo is going to New York. Gustavo you know. was, yeah. Yes. Like mass exodus. All yeah, this. exactly. Well, yeah. Cause the whole PR department left too. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I'm sure there's so many good reasons that everyone's, you know, making decisions for themselves. But um, but anyway, so that's been that's been one of the biggest challenges is like, OK, you know, book these people and then create a marketing strategy and then create a, a philanthropic reserve and a base. And even the grants like those take nine months to get. So everything this first six months has to be cash basis. Like we have no grants that were written for this season because there was no season last year. So that's like the harder thing, but it's not uh, detrimental. Like I think that we're still actually able to present world-class stuff, but what it means is that I can produce less plays. You know, those just like opera, you know, uh, like uh, one show that we did with, with Pop, the opera company cost $90,000. So you can't do that if you didn't have a reserve built up to it because you're not going to cover that in ticket sales, which is very similar with theater. It's a little cheaper with theater, but not much. So it's like, that is the thing that I'm really excited in 2025 and we'll do some more in later this season, but it's like to present more plays and intimate uh, plays because that's what we were known for. So I don't want to throw that away. It's just uh, a matter of timing. It's not possible <laughs> given the space, you know. Right. You, you mentioned, you know, jazz clubs. I mean, this is not a city known for jazz clubs the way New York is by any stretch of the imagination. Brad Meldow can play a, a week at the Village Vanguard, but he'll come here and he'll play Walt Disney Concert Hall once and make right. more money. And I think right. in the process, sacrifice the intimacy. As good as yeah. Walt Disney Concert Hall is, it's not the same as seeing Brad Meldow at the Village Vanguard. Oh, that's true. There's nothing like New York jazz. But Brad Meldow did record an album at Largo, which is one of our good jazz clubs. You know? Yes, <laughs> he is. Yes, yes yeah. he did. He did. Yeah. But and 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 I've I speak to a lot of jazz artists as part of cultural attache, and they tell me that they're the you know that they don't think of that there's a great jazz club here in yeah. Los Angeles, except people are now starting to become aware of Sam First over by the airport. Oh, I don't know that one yet. Sam First is a small intimate club. So I only say that as a suggestion of exploring that because yeah. people who are going to the airport are going to be West Side people mm -hmm. potentially. So maybe there's an affiliation there, something that, yeah. that can happen so that more communities can experience good jazz. 
Yeah, and we have great. some of the best artists in the world here, and they're doing <laughs> sessions every day. You know, um, it's just a different scene. So I think giving them not a jazz club, but like you know, an intimate way to see like multi Grammy winning performers like twenty feet away from you is a very unique experience that I think will catch on. I mean, honestly, sales to that have been going really well, and they've only been on sale you know a month or so. Um, so I think it's going to happen uh, with the jazz series. And it's easier to present than play, if you can imagine, you know? Well, yeah, particularly if you're dealing with a soloist. Yeah, and even trios, there's no set designer, there's no props, there's no a stage manager, you know, call sheets. I mean, it's just so much easier. Again, I want to produce plays, but it's like jazz, we're going to try to do as much as possible because the community wants it and they, they, they need to see it. Right. Now, I think partnerships are at the root of what makes performing arts organizations really thrive. Mm -hmm. And through your career... We've already mentioned Pacific Opera Project, but you've you've been involved with Wild Up, with Martha Graham Dance, with Heidi Duckler, and countless other organizations. Do you see opportunities to partner with these organizations that you were once, you know, a contributor to or an executive with? You know, not necessarily to perform the same things, but as a as a as an opportunity for them to try out new work in a smaller, less eyes on them way, or for them to do things that they can't do as part of their regular seasons. Absolutely. Yep. And that is how a lot of this season already got booked. I already mentioned Greg and the partnership there. Um, we're doing, I mean, what I want to do is a lot more dance, which just takes longer to, to develop. But one of the dance companies that I'm involved with um, is planning to do workshops. I can't announce it yet, but it's like doing workshops to basically make it worth it. I can't pay what the Soraya can pay for one night. But what we can do is offer space. We can offer community experiences in the space that they can bring, you know, uh, students into workshop things. Um, so certainly that's on the table. And I think that's our unique market position now as well. It's like, I control the building, I control the space. So until the money's there, we can find different ways to partner and highlight voices that couldn't otherwise get out there. Right. Now, I know, I I, I don't want to continually rely on on Thor, but it, but it was a, a recent conversation that I had with him. And he's not terribly optimistic about where the arts are headed in Los Angeles. He thinks that half of the organizations that are currently around will not be around in the next five years. Um, but he did say, I do think that certain arts organizations emerge. Certain trends start to favor certain alternatives and hopefully live performance alternatives. What do you see as the trends? What do you predict are the trends that are going to emerge in the next couple of years that that might just benefit the Sierra Madre Playhouse in ways that they would not necessarily benefit another organization. Yeah. So what's unique here, I mean, just in general, like immersive experiences, you know, um, I think making it a whole evening, not just a show is going to be essential. Again, not just having your audience come through, get a program, sit down and leave. I don't think that that's going to cut through the noise of everything else they can do. Uh, but, you know, like if we, do a play about, uh, you know, growing up as a uh, Mexican American in Los Angeles, having food trucks outside, having mariachi music uh, in the lobby, having a full experience of, of that play transcending out onto the street. I think that makes it more a thing to see and, and it will stop you. So we've tried, you know, we're planning a lot of things and Wild Up actually did things similar to that too. It's like they, for a long time, prioritize the audience experience as a whole evening, not just a show. And I think that's going to be important. And that is a trend. And you see these with them, like, even commercial venues, not nonprofits, but it's like, you know, the Stranger Things experience. And it's pretty cool. You know, it's taking that digital platform that they're doing and then making a, a physical version of it is pretty cool. Now, you know, I know that you know, you're just at the beginning of, of celebrating the 100th anniversary. So it's probably a little bit foolish to ask you my last question, which is, if you were to look forward to the 200th anniversary, which none of us is going to be, none of us watching this or a part of this conversation will be around for. But if you could foresee the Sierra Madre Playhouse of 2124 celebrating its 200th anniversary, mm -hmm. what would you hope that anniversary would look like? And what would you like your legacy to be as part of that anniversary? Um, I think an expanded audience and more inclusive and diverse audience. Um, and that is also the genres they present. Um, but I think 
you know, in 200 years, even the brand recognition that everyone knows that, uh, you know, Sierra Madre Playhouse is a welcoming space to be, regardless of who you are. Um, you know, I think that that would be a huge accomplishment. And I think it'll happen. You know, there are already so many community members that have been patrons and fans for 50 years that now their kids and their grandkids are patrons. That I think it's going to happen. It's a unique spot in a unique community. Like, it's, I think it's going to last. You know, the building might change. I don't know if the building will hold up another 100 years. Um, but it'll be there, I think.